Hello everyone. I'm excited to bring you this video today. It's something I've been working on for a little while, but I feel like it has had a huge impact on me. It's called Let the Tares Grow. Are our expectations about how the Lord will do and accomplish his work sometimes far from the reality? I myself at times ask why is evil being allowed to win? Even in the church sometimes it feels it like it is allowed to win. I have had some friends who ask why isn't the prophet clear on the points of doctrine or why doesn't the church support certain legislation or why does the church support certain legislation publicly? As I have prayed, this is the answer that has come to me and given me great comfort and I hope it will bless you with greater understanding. Let's look at the parable of the wheat and the tares. In Matthew chapter 13 we read, And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemies came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade had sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. In the parable we see the Lord says, to let the tares grow. He makes no move to halt their growth. In fact, it seems essential that they be allowed to grow. Essential in the sense that if they were stopped in some manner, this would hurt the progress of the wheat. What does this mean, to let the tares grow? In Matthew 5.39, Christ says, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. God's ways are higher than our ways. He knows how to get from point A to point B the most effectively. Christ states that we should not resist evil. What does that mean? I think we can get an idea or get some idea by Christ's life and ministry. For example, Christ allowed Judas to betray him. He chose him as an apostle even though he knew the end result, and Christ didn't resist this evil. He allowed himself to be killed. After his death and resurrection, he didn't stop the great apostasy. All these things would appear very distressing if we lived in those times, and may even to us now, they may appear to be to us mistakes but God does not make mistakes let's explore this more through the words of Joseph Smith said Joseph our lives have already become jeopardized by revealing the wicked and bloodthirsty purposes of our enemies and for the future we must cease to do so all we have said about them is truth but it is not always wise to relate all the truth even Jesus, the Son of God, had to refrain from doing so, and he had to restrain his feelings many times for the safety of himself and his followers, and had to conceal the righteous purposes of his heart in relation to many things pertaining to his father's kingdom. When still a boy, he had all the intelligence necessary to enable him to rule and govern the kingdom of the Jews and could reason with the wisest and most profound doctors of the law and divinity, and make their theories and practices to appear like folly compared with the wisdom he possessed. But he was a boy only and lacked physical strength even to defend his own person. 
and was subject to cold, to hunger, and to death. So it is with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We have the revelation of Jesus, and the knowledge within us is sufficient to organize a righteous government upon the earth and give universal peace to all mankind if they would receive it. But we lack the physical strength, as did our Savior when a child, to defend our principles, and we have a necessity to be afflicted, persecuted, and smitten, and to bear it patiently until Jacob is of age. Then we will take care of himself. Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith Does the Prophet and the Twelve have to conceal the righteous purposes of their hearts in relation to many things pertaining to God's kingdom, as Joseph Smith related above? Didn't God command to let the tares grow? The, bro the brethren have always stood up for truth, but they don't bang us on the head until we listen. If we fail to listen to them and to the previous voices God has sent, then we may awake and find that we have been allowed to grow up as tares. Remember, the prophet doesn't decide the direction of the church. In reality, the members of the church do. What I mean is the prophets have righteous desires to lead the church toward Zion, but often God restrains them. For example, consider Moses. He, ha he and the Lord wanted the Israelites to have the greater law and priesthood, but the Israelites rejected it. Moses wanted to inherit the promised land, but the people weren't prepared to inherit it. The Lord and Samuel wanted the Israelites to have judges, but the Israelites chose to have kings. The members control the direction of the church by what they are willing to receive and live. In Doctrine and Covenants 30, section 38, For all flesh is corrupted before me, and the powers of darkness prevail upon the earth among the children of men, in the presence of all the host of heaven which causeth silence to reign, and all eternity is pained, and the angels are waiting the great command to reap down the earth, to gather the tares, that they may be burned, and behold, the enemy is combined. All flesh is corrupted before me is indeed a warning that should humble us. It should cause us to ask, Is all well in Zion? As we strive to be wheat in a world of tares, we, like the apostles, should ask, Is it I, Lord? Ezra Taft Benson stated, Sometimes we hear someone refer to a division in the church. In reality, the church is not divided. It simply means that there are some who, for the time being at least, are members of the church but not in harmony with it. These people have a temporary membership and influence in the church, but unless they repent, they will be missing when the final membership records are recorded. It is well that our people understand this principle, so they will not be misled by those apostates within the church who have not yet repented or been cut off. But there is a cleansing coming. The Lord says, that his vengeance shall be poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth, and upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord, first among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name, and have not known me. I look forward to that cleansing. Its need within the church is becoming increasingly apparent. The Lord strengthened the faith of the early apostles by pointing out Judas as a traitor, even before this apostle had completed his iniquitous work. So also in our day the Lord has told us of the tares within the wheat that will eventually be hewn down when they are fully ripe. But until they are hewn down, they will be with us, among us. The hymn entitled, Though in the outward church below contains this thought yes within the church today there are tares among the wheat and wolves within the flock as president clark stated 
The ravening wolves are amongst us from our own membership, and they more than any. And that quote is cut there. We should be careful of them. And it states that they wear the habiliments of the priesthood in that section. The wolves among our flock are more numerous and devious today than when President Clark made this statement. President McKay has said that the church is little, if at all, injured by the persecution and calumnies from ignorant, misinformed, or malicious enemies. A greater hindrance to its progress comes from fault finders, shriekers, commandment breakers, and apostate cliques within its own ecclesiastical and quorum groups. Not only are there apostates within our midst, but there are also apostate doctrines that are sometimes taught in our classes and from our pulpits and that appear in our publications. These apostate precepts of men cause our people to stumble. As the Book of Mormon, speaking of our day, states, They have all gone astray, save a few, who are the humble followers of Christ. Nevertheless, they are led that in many instances they do err, because they are taught by the precepts of men. That was Ezra Taft Benson in his talk to the humble followers of Christ. We might ask ourselves why members like church historian Leonard J. Arrington have been allowed to influence the church so much. Why aren't these members expelled? The answer I am coming to see is the command of God to allow the tares and wheat to grow together. President Benson stated these people have a temporary membership and influence in the church. We see how wicked people are given power over righteous people in Alma chapter 14. And it came to pass that they took Alma and Amulek and carried them forth to the place of martyrdom that they might witness the destruction of those who were consumed by fire. And when Amulek saw the pains of the women and the children who were consuming in the fire, he also was pained. And he said unto Alma, How can we witness this awful scene? Therefore let us stretch forth our hands and exercise the power of God which is in us and save them from the flames. But Alma said unto him, The Spirit constraineth me that I must not stretch forth mine hand. For behold, the Lord receiveth them up unto himself in glory, and he doth suffer that they may do this thing, or that the people may do this thing unto them according to the hardness of their hearts that the judgments which he shall exercise upon them in his wrath may be just. And the blood of the innocent shall stand as a witness against them, yea, and cry mightily against them at the last day. The wheat need the tares to grow. The wheat need the tares to progress. The, wheat, the tares need to grow relatively undisturbed until they are ripe and ready for justice from God. Vengeance is his. In Doctrine and Covenants 86, we read, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, my servants, concerning the parable of the wheat and tares. Behold, verily I say, the field was the world, the apostles were the sowers of the seed. And after they have fallen asleep, the great persecutor of the church, the apostate, the whore, even Babylon, that maketh all nations to drink of her cup, in whose hearts the enemy, even Satan, sitteth to reign. Behold, he soweth tares, wherefore the tares choke the wheat, and drive the church into the wilderness. But behold, in the last days, even now, while the Lord is beginning to bring forth the word, and the blade is springing up, and is yet tender, behold, verily I say unto you, the angels are crying unto the Lord day and night, who are ready and waiting to be sent forth to reap down the fields. But the Lord saith unto them, Pluck not up the tares, while the blade is yet tender, for verily your faith is weak, lest you destroy the wheat also. Therefore let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest is fully ripe. Then ye shall first gather out the wheat from among the tares, and after the gathering of the wheat, 
Behold, and lo, the tares are bound in bundles, and the field remaineth to be burned. Elder Neil A. Maxwell states, Years ago I wandered over the scriptural imagery of angels waiting day and night for the great command to come down and reap the tares in a, a wicked and suffering world. It seemed rather eager to me. Given such massive needless human suffering, I don't wonder any more. Even so, the final reaping will occur only when the Father determines the world is fully ripe. Meanwhile, brothers and sisters, the challenge is surviving spiritually in a deteriorating wheat and tares world. One thing that is certain through history is the Lord's people have most often been proud and rebellious with brief windows of repentance and righteousness. The lesson to be learned is to awake to our own shortcomings and return to Christ through repentance before we are ripe for destruction. All is never and really has never been well in Zion. Zion must constantly check herself against the will of God and correct her path, keeping a rigorous, righteous pace. Ezekiel 12, 2, we read, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, Church members will live in this wheat and tare situation until the millennium. Some real tares even masquerade as wheat, including the few eager individuals who lecture the rest of us about church doctrines in which they no longer believe. They criticize the use of church resources to which they no longer contribute. They con condescendingly seek to counsel the brethren whom they no longer sustain. Confrontive, except of themselves, of course, they leave the church, but they cannot leave the church alone. In 1894, President Woodruff said, this is Ezra Taft Benson speaking, in 18, or this is what Ezra Taft Benson said, and I'm reading, in 1894, President Woodruff said, God has held the angels of destruction for many years, lest they should reap down the wheat with the tares. But I want to tell you now that those angels have left the portals of heaven, and they stand over this people and this nation now, and are hovering over the earth, waiting to pour out the judgments. And from this very day, they shall be poured out. Calamities and troubles are increasing in the earth. And there is a meaning to those things. We need the constant guidance of the Spirit. We live in an age of deceit. O oh, my people, said Isaiah in the Book of Mormon, they who lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Even within the church we have been warned that ravening wolves are amongst us for our own membership, and they from our own membership, and they more than any others are clothed in sheep's clothing because they wear the habiliments of the priesthood. The Lord holds us accountable if we are not wise and are deceived. For they that are not wise, he said, and have received the truth and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide and have not been deceived, verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire but shall abide the day. So if we don't understand a direction that the church is going, remember that the members really decide the direction of the church. We have been taught the proper principles or have them available to learn. Agency, the right to choose one's own way, will not be infringed even when tares were allowed to uh, to drag the church into apostasy. Right after Christ established it, killing the apostles, God's church never is destroyed from without. It must always happen from within first. Remember that God has commanded to leave the tares to grow. 
We won't crush the tares or remove the tares. The Lord and his angels will accomplish this in his own time, reaping them up for the fire. It reminds me of what Christ said to Peter. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. If we remember the story, Christ had commissioned his apostles to spread and preach the gospel. Peter, being in stress, chose to go fishing, and others followed him. They have no luck fishing all night, and the Savior appears on the shore and tells them where to cast the net for a bountiful catch. They do, and then they realize it is Christ who is speaking to them. They excitedly get to the shore, and they cook some fish, which they share with Christ. And there Christ asks Peter if he loves him more than these meaning the fish or the fishing. Christ repeats this statement three times in various ways, challenging Peter to feed his sheep, to be a fisher of men. Verse 18 follows this question and challenge pattern. To me, I can see Christ feeling like an, the old man. His earthly ministry is over, and now he works through fallen man even more so to accomplish his work, but like Peter did on this occasion, man often carries the church whither he wouldest not. The people go in a direction that the prophet wouldn't have them go in, and warns against the same Christ. Even amazing individuals like Peter might take it sometimes in a direction that wasn't the best direction like choosing to go fishing rather than being a missionary or taking the gospel to all the world we're all learning we all make mistakes the trouble is that we don't become proud and direct our families or those around us in the wrong direction but that we follow the prophet that we seek to build the church and that we stay within our lanes of revelation. Isaiah 6 Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. The Book of Mormon Institute Student Manual states in regards to this verse, Isaiah was commissioned to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, even though the people were hard of hearing and failed to see the truth of the gospel. He was advised that his preaching to a wayward people would generally not be received. Their hearts would fatten against the truth. Their ears would be heavy, not willing to accept the gospel as preached in clarity. Isaiah was not commissioned to make the people resistant to the truth. Rather, he was advised of the difficulty of his mission. Even so, in answer to Isaiah's query of how long, the Lord answered that the people should have the opportunity to accept the gospel until the land be utterly desolate. The Lord will graciously continue his mission of salvation through his servants so long as time shall last, or the earth shall stand, or there shall be one man upon the face thereof to be saved. Isaiah preached to tares until their hearts were heavy and their ears were fat. I am sure the tares of this day twisted, or the tares of his day, twisted his words to match whatever fit their narrative. So we may conclude that 
It is not the current prophet's duty to uproot the tares. In fact, his call is to warn and let the tares alone. We may question the Lord's ways, but this would be foolish. He knows we need the tares to grow. If the wheat is to grow also to its full potential, doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith. Follow the prophet and trust in that God that called him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.